So can we get the presentation started? Thank you. So today's talk will be on the heart of services. I'm going to preach you the glory of loose coupling and what the impact on, on architecture is and uh, the application system structures that you have. So here's the agenda. I talk about the definition of loose coupling, how loose coupling is realized in messaging, in web service land, in the traditional web service land, in the more modern web-centric REST land. What are the architectural implications of uh, loose coupling? I will touch on microservices and some principles that you should follow to build microservices, and then I conclude. So first of all, what about loose coupling? There's a famous book about loose coupling called Loose Coupled by Doug Kane. I assume that we yet to get the handout so that you will find out uh, whether the book is worth to spend some uh, time reading it. And here is a picture that most of you have seen because it's often used in uh, presentations. This was one of my customers I, when I was at IBM. This is their application architecture. Each box is an application system, not a single function. And the, and the lines basically mean the communication path. Which application needs to talk with, with other application in order to support a real business function? So it's, it's clear that you can't use procedure calls for that, because procedure calls have a bunch of problems, because procedure calls make you being tightly coupled because they have a lots of assumptions between the called and the calling method. And here are the, uh, are the uh, assumptions. Both methods run in the same address space. Both methods are written in the same language. Uh, the calling method has to pass the exactly expected number of parameters to the called method. And the call is immediate. That means asynch it's asynchronous. Synchronous. So, and in order to to weaken some of these assumptions that they must run the same process and so on, uh, technology came up with the idea of remote procedure call. And a remote procedure call is a call that goes across the wire. It basically attempts to make remote communication via RPC make behave like a local call because, yeah, this is the upside, because the semantics of a call is familiar to developer. And if you have distributed application, it would be nice if you have a call across the distributed uh, components. Uh, but the downside is that remote communication invalidates many of the assumptions that are behind a local um, call. So it means RPC doesn't have the semantics. Here is why. So RPC, uh, the called method, might not be available because of network fragmentation or because of uh, server outages. That means there's a time dependency. One question you need to respond, for example, is how long should a caller wait if the response doesn't come back? Right? And what to do if you think the server is not responding? Very difficult questions. The other problem, the other difference between RPC and the local call is, well, the, rem rem the remote method that you are calling is um, provided by a third party, by a different party. That means you're by a business partner. That means you have a format dependency. What if the third party is unfriendly and changes the signature of the method, changes some of the parameters? Well, tough luck. You must change your client application. Difficult. It's a problem. The other problem is the calling function uh, has a pointer to the application. So you have the address, hard co often hard-coded in your application, some IP address. And what if the function is moved by the provider to a different machine? Right, you need to change your, your application. We call it reference autonomy. Then there is platform dependency, uh, although this today has been weakened uh, a lot in RPC, but the parameters have to match the machine architecture. You all have heard about little engine, big engine. You, uh, if you send strings, right, you have to think about the locale of, of the string that you are sending around, so difficult problems to solve. So summary, the volatility of RPC is caused by well, there is t uh, time autonomy violation. That means uh, the ingredients have to be available at the same time. Format autonomy means the number of types and parameters much match the violation of the uh, format autonomy. Violation of reference autonomy means you have hard-coded addresses. And violation of platform autonomy is that the internal representation of the data, like little and back end, can have to be known by both communication parties. So if we negate that, the dependencies that we have, we come to something that is loose coupling. So loose coupling is, at the heart of loose coupling, we basically say 
that the number uh, of assumptions that the communication partners uh, do about the communication must be reduced significantly. That means we are now negating the bad effects of violating time, format, and so on, and then we come to a definition of uh, loose coupling. Loose coupling means you are reference autonomous. That means you don't speak to a concrete program, but you speak to a logical place where you place requests to, and you don't know who is actually grabbing the request and processing it. Next is time autonomy. That means the communication partners can run at their own speed, right? And this means basically asynchronous communication. Next is uh, format autonomy, the producer and the recipient of the language uh, of, of, of the request may have completely different formatting assumptions. And uh, finally, you have platform autonomy, that means that the consumer and producer of information requests can live on completely different platforms. So how is that solved in messaging? The problem has been solved uh, in messaging uh, 30, nearly 40 uh, dec uh, decades ago, years ago. Uh, there's a very famous book by a friend of mine, and men, some of you might know him too, called Gregor Hoppe, Enterprise Integration Patterns. He has written a book, 700 pages, that teaches you the best practices of how to achieve loose coupling with some of the benefits that I'm going to talk about. So he's basically coming up with so-called patterns. Patterns are best practices in the area how to couple an application to a messaging infrastructure, how to produce messages and that like. So I'm not going into the details, but each of the boxes represent some 10 best practices patterns, what you need to do in order to become loosely coupled. And so how is reference autonomy achieved in uh, messaging? Well, the producer and consumer, they communicate via cues or topics. Right? They don't know each other. You don't know which, of the, which concrete program is listening for incoming messages on your queue. Right? And the producer doesn't know that. The producer is just sending messages to queue. And if you have a router after uh, a particular queue, then the producer only needs to know a single queue. Then you have a router. And the router then makes decisions where to route your message to. So you are completely decoupled. You even don't know what program is consuming your requests or your information. Time autonomy is achieved. Well, messaging is all about asynchrony, right? You can send messages in a one-to-one -one manner to a queue, one-to-one -one communication, or you have one-to-many uh, communication. The sender publishes a message on a topic, and this is time autonomy because processing inherently is asynchronous. So next is platform autonomy. Well, an application that is using messaging is typically not aware about messaging. And this is why you wrapper an, uh, an, uh, an application by means of an endpoint. And an endpoint basically plugs an, an application that is not messaging aware to a messaging infrastructure. And, and even the messaging, and so, and the endpoint really wrappers a program that is written in, in Java, that is written in COBOL, that is written in Prolog, all the old languages, right? And you can communicate with each other. This is platform autonomy. You don't need the implementation details of a recipient or producer of a message. And even you can, you can couple different messaging products, right? If you use MQ series or some JMS implementation, they can communicate because there's something called a messaging bridge that reaches across the different platforms. So we achieved in messaging many decades ago platform autonomy. And the same is true for format autonomy because messages can be transformed on the wire. So you send a certain format here, this is the sender, and then it gets transformed on the wire by appropriate middleware. And then you massage the message and the recipient gets, to, gets the message in a format it is, for, it, it is it's just expecting. Format autonomy. It's a very nice world here. So, what is happening in traditional SOA, WS Star, Web Service Platform? Well, there is a book, Web Service Platform Architecture, that teaches what are web services, how to use them, and I'm summarizing, so to speak, some aspects of it, namely, how do, yeah, first of all, how do message endpoints come into uh, the space of web services? Well, again, web services can be the clients and servers, can be services themselves, can be written in any programming languages, and again, you may have endpoint wrappers, so to speak, that wrap a service so that you can have a service that is written in completely different programming languages, communicating with clients, again, written in completely pro different programming languages. And the notion of an endpoint, you may not have heard it in, in traditional SOA, comes into the game because a message endpoint basically 
um, implements or, or, or is proxying implementation of particular interfaces. And the endpoint is at a particular address, right? And this endpoint wrappers or, or is a proxy to different implementation of interfaces. And you can send to the endpoint messages that are coming in particular formats across very, very different uh, protocols. And in SOA, right, this is realized by a port type. Interfaces are specified as port types. The endpoint addresses are so-called ports. And then the uh, different formats and, and transportation protocols, they are realized by so-called bindings, which is at the heart, most of you know that, of WSL. So WSL specifies what an endpoint is in order to contribute to loose coupling. Then um, if a sender sends a message to an ultimate receiver in SOA, right, what typically happens is that you don't send the message directly, but you have so-called intermediates. Right? So you send a message to your gateway, then you send it through a firewall. Here's the recipient gateway. And so there are intermediates. And what happens especially is the transport protocol may change along the message path. That basically means the sender communicates via JMS with, with its own gateway. Then you have HTTPS across the interface, uh, uh, internet to go to a firewall. Then you use message queuing here and RMI over IOP here. So it's a bad assumption to rely on the quality of services of a transport protocol, which is done in REST-based web services that we are discussing next. So REST is based on HTTP, HTTPS, right? And, but in practice, right, you must, have, you must take care about changing protocols when you want to ensure quality of services like security, uh, transactedness, and so on. How is that realized in SOA? Right? It's realized by SOAP messages. Right? This is only a very brief introduction. SOAP uh, is a messaging architecture that allows you to stick um, attributes, properties in, in so-called message headers, right? in the SOAP headers, and the header blocks indicate to the middleware how to cope with a particular message. Do I need to, do I need to uh, encrypt it, for example? Do I put transaction context into the message header? And that like. So how is loose coupling realized? Right, you have reference autonomy in SOA because client interacts with an endpoint, right, a Bristol port, and you don't know at all what is the implementation uh, that is listening behind the port. You have time autonomy because, for example, you may use JMS bindings, so then you have asynchrony in the transport protocol, or you follow particular patterns, right? You put a reply to header to your message, correlation identifiers, and so on. It's a well-established pattern so that you can, can asynchronous communicate with, with the service. Uh, platform autonomy is at the very heart of SOA again because clients and servers can reside on completely different, uh, in completely different environments. And format autonomy basically, again, the binding specifies what the serialization format is that the service does expect. And then on the wire, a service bus typically has the capability to transform uh, the message to the proper format. Um, so how is then loose coupling achieved in REST, another important architectural style? So REST, no, honey? Yeah, so REST, for, first of all, there are three books again. The book in the middle is my favorite books on, on web services. So if you want to learn what, well, sorry, on REST, if you want to understand what REST is, take a look at this book. So REST is an architectural style. It's not a particular technology. You can implement REST, if you like, over JMS, although the most prominent implementation is over HTTP, HTTPS. It allows to apply the web architecture to any kind of uh, uh, communication architecture or uh, application architecture. And it's an abbreviation. It means representational state transfer. And it basically means you interact with URI addressable resources, whether the resource is a static website that you read or a program that you want to communicate with. Everything is addressed by URIs, uniform resource indicators. You only have four verbs. Com uh, for commands, so to speak, get, put, post, delete in order to communicate with the resource. Very simple interface. You have standard data formats like a HTML, XML, uh, JSON. So any kind of MIME type can flow across the wire if you use REST. And REST interaction is stateless. That means a server will never recall that you have been there. All the context of your communication is in the message headers. Right? All the history of an interaction is in the message header if you need something like a session, which helps you to scale um, uh, tremendously. 
So reference autonomy client communicates with a URI, and the URI basically is some sort of a proxy, again, to the implementation of the resource. Right? So the URI decouples from knowing the actual piece of code that is invoked when you communicate with the uh, URI. And we will discuss later on for a minute uh, this acronym that increases reference autonomy still. Time autonomy is a little bit tricky in REST. So some requests may take a long time. That means you want to decouple a client with a service in time. So you can do that um, by um, a server. If you implement a, a, a REST interface and the S REST interface, the implementation knows that the request takes some time, it basically returns a 202 accepted status code that says, OK, it will take some time. I accepted the request. I will do my very best to process the, uh, the, the request simulator for the result. Right? And this is done as follows. So here, for example, you send, a, you, you send an, an, an image. It's a multi-part MIME message here, an image to this URI. You want to beautify my image, for example. And then, because it takes so long to beautify me, the server says, 202 accepted. It takes some time. And then within the body of the response message, you have what is called a task object. The task object rep reports the status of the long-running request, and it says, OK, the status is still running. And you have a special header field, the content location header field, that contains a URL of this status uh, uh, object. And you can use this URL in the content location header field in a, in a succeeding get request. And the succeeding request on the very same task object that got created will then result in the HTTP 200 saying, well, the status is still running. But OK, the estimated completion time has been delayed because Frank's image needs some special processing. At some point in time, to iteratively poll for the status, whenever you like, you get a response back, 303 see other. See other basically indicates that the processing stopped. And then the task object basically says, now the processing is done. And you have another header field called the, loca the location header field that now has the URI, the pointer to the processed request. And then you can have a get on this URI here, and you get the result. But be careful, because if you get, if you issue a get on the task, what may happen is that you get back an HTTP 200, and then the status reports that the processing got failed. So the the um, Retrieve request of the task uh, uh, object got OK, right? But the status of the long running task got failed. So, this is, so to speak, the best practice, the pattern that you follow in order to add long running requests uh, to REST. Platform autonomy is at the heart of REST because the premier platform communication protocol is over HTTP. So, and you know, HTTP clients and servers are available in all major environments, and you can write HTTP clients and HTTP servers in each and any programming language. So, platform autonomy is given in the rest. And format autonomy comes, something, uh, comes based on something that's called uh, uh, content negotiation. It's a certain uh, protocol that you need to follow in HTTP. So, you issue a request, and you can indicate what kind of format you would like to get back. Do, I want to, do you want to get a JSON object back or an XML document back? You indicate that, and then the server basically does that. By this means, you can, you can achieve format autonomy because you basically specify what kind of message uh, you would like to get back. Hate OS, terrible acronym, means hypermedia as the engine of application state. It decouples you further from uh, from your client because the client from your server because the server now uh, in the server's response will tell you what are the APIs you can invoke next. This looks as follows. That basically means you issue a certain request, right? Uh, the request went okay, and within the uh, response you get a set of links, and the links contain the URIs the APIs you can invoke next. So th you uh, want to uh, get a certain order, and then you get the details of the order. And what you can do next is report it by the server. Say, well, you can, ta you can cancel your order, or you can ask for a certain shipping date. So the server does not only produce you the data that represent the result, but also links to APIs that may be acted on next. 
And the links are hypermedia. This is why this terrible acronym is called hypermedia as the engine of application state, because this is the state of your application, right? In this actual state, you can, you can cancel uh, you, or you can request the shipping of your order. And this comes with a maturity model. REST is a whole maturity model. If you use only a single HTTP verb, namely post and carry all of the application context in the body of the HTTP message as SOAP and uh, uh, XML RPC does, then you are still in the swamp of POX, right? plain old XML, right? because you didn't get what REST is. Right? You only use post and all the application context, what is the object you want to manipulate, what is the function, is deeply buried in the HTTP message. Uh, we can get better, we can get better by modeling resources and saying, okay, I have an order, I have uh, uh, a customer object, right? And you use post to communicate with the clearly identified resources, but what do you want from the objects, right, is still buried in the method. So the HTTP method basically says, I want to uh, place an order. Right? But you send it to the order URI, but what you want to do with the, with the, with the object is buried in the HTTP request. This is similar to object technology, and this level of maturity is called, well, you understood what HTTP resources are, REST resources are. If you basically use the proper HTTP methods, put, get, post, uh, delete, and if you use HTTP status codes and header fields, as I briefly outlined in why REST is uh, loosely, loosely coupled, I'll give you some examples, right? then you are at the level of HTTP verbs, you use HTTP perfectly, right? and then the next level is uh, if you support hate or ass, you are at the level of media controls, a REST uh, religious fan will say this is what you want to achieve, but in practice, only very, very few APIs uh, are interacting based on hate OS, so in practice this is not used. And there are many vendors that are at the maturity level 2, and this is fine. If you are at maturity level 2, this is a very excellent vendor uh, that allows you to benefit from all of HTTP. And if you want to understand the difference between the REST-based web services and SOA-based web services, when to use which paradigm, where well, there's a reference to a paper that a colleagues, uh, some colleagues and I have written, and many people like that paper. The architectural implications are as follows. So I need to remind you there are two different kinds of faults. The first kind of, so first of all, a fault is an event within a system that causes the system to stop, to fail. We are not discussing about application failures, but when does the system stop? And there are two kinds of faults. The first fault is called a Heisenberg, according to Heisenberg, quantum uh, Heisenberg physics, right? It's, uh, you don't know where an electron is, right? You only know it's probably here or probably there, right? If you take a look at it, you can't find it, right? You cannot expect that it periodically comes back, right? And the Heisenberg is a transient fault that does not reoccur because you don't know where the electron is. In contrast to a Bohrbug, it's a permanent fault, right? If you issue the request over and over again, the system goes down the drain over and over again, right? It's according to the Bohr, uh, 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 atomic model where electrons are ellipses, you can precisely say where the electron basically is. And how do you fix these kind of bugs? If you have a bore bug, a, re a repetitive bug, well, there is no repair. You need to wait for a fix uh, of your vendor. But if you have a Heisenberg, right, a Heisenberg repair is very easy. Uh, you shut down the application and you restart it. And then it works because it's not repeatable. And luckily, most of severe software faults are Heisenbugs and not more bugs. That means you basically switch, your, you shut your application down, and then you restart it again. And this is, if you have such a, such a Heisenbug, you want to detect the bug as soon as possible, the, 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 the fault, and restart the system again. So you, we want to have fail fast techniques. You want to fail fast and recover the whole system. And this is done by a component called a watchdog. A watchdog is a special program that detects a fault uh, uh, in, in the application and fails fast. Uh, so it does so by monitoring the liveness of components and recreate a fault, failed component immediately, which is equivalent to shut down and retry. So the application component fails, right? And then if the watchdog, so it's shut down, and if the watchdog detects that, it restarts it again. This is switching off, switching on again. 
So, and how do you do that? The watchdog can, for example, have a heartbeat protocol. The applications are sending periodically I'm alive messages to the watchdog. Or the pulse technique uh, is that the watchdog is going to the application and feeling the pulse. Are you still alive? Are you still alive? Are you still alive? And if you don't respond, if you don't feel the, feel the pulse, you are dead, you are recreated. Right? Uh, the other solution is if the applications are applic uh, applications that are listening on a message queue, each message implementation, message queue implementation allows you to detect the number of different programs that are listening on the queue. If the watchdog basically knows how many programs it started, it only needs to monitor the cardinality, the number of applications are, and if this number is going down, the watchdog knows the component dropped and it recreates it. And there are other techniques, so I'm skipping over that in the interest of time. So what you can do based on loose coupling, right? you can, for example, in the messaging case, you can build so-called hot pools. A hot pool is a set of, of identical components, application components. So you're a credit card processor, but you instantiate it multiple times, and all of the instances of your application are listening, for example, on the same input queue, clients sending messages to the input queue, and the next available free application grabs the message and processes it. This is a hot pool in order to achieve scalability, high availability, and so on. Right? And when a member fails, right, the other members are still there and can grab messages, and the client doesn't even know that one of the components dropped. Right? And so you achieve availability. Your, your clustered service, your hot pool is always available. But what if, so as long as a single member is in the hot pool, you are available. But if all the members are gone, you're not available. How do you prevent that? What a surprise. You add a watchdog to it because the watchdog is monitoring the cardinality of the members in the hot pool. And, the, uh, and, and if one member drops, the watchdog recreates. Uh, Reinstantiates a member, so the hot pool cardinality is nearly constant, which uh, guarantees high availability. Next thing is something I fear about. It's a little bit of uh, mathematics. Right? What you see here is a formula um, of how do you compute the availability class of a hot pool. Right? The mathematical explanation speaks about, well, if components fail independently, right, then you have independent events. The, uh, the independent events are binomial distributed, right, and the availability means if you have at least one member in the hot pool, and so on, blah, 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 blah. What comes out is a formula that says that the availability of a hot pool is, uh, is uh, one, minus, 1 minus the availability of a member uh, to the power of n, where n is the number of members in hot pool. This is a very fas fascinating uh, consequence. If you build a terrible piece of code, so a piece of code that is only 80% available, that basically means a piece of code that my dog can write, right? Incredibly bad. If you have eight instances of this incredibly bad component in a hot pool, you reach availability class nine, uh, five. That basically means you can write terrible bad code from an availability perspective. If you apply this architectural concept of hot pools, you get a high, high, high available system. This is why this technique is so well known, why people lose this uh, loose coupling stuff. Hot pooling can also contribute to scalability in the sense, well, the SLOs, uh, so the watchdog monitors the SLOs in your hot pool. Right? If the watchdog detects that certain SLOs are jeopardized to not be met, it's, it starts additional members. That means scale out. And um, if the members are no longer needed, right, the hot pool ensures uh, scale in again. So this is what the watchdog can also do. And again, remember, this is all done based on loose coupling, in this case, um, based on message queuing. And an application system, an application system Needs to be so an application system is a set of components that must interact with, with each other. It's a complicated, complicated application, and all of the comp complicated all of the pieces must be available in order to serve your customer. That's an application system. So an application system must be stable. Stable means it must keep processing requests even if there are transient impulses or persistent stresses to your component, or one component fails, your system must react and be stable. So an intermediate, so an impulse is a rapid shock to the system. It's like whacking a hammer to your system. 
And stress is basically you constantly push something against your system, you add pressure to it right, for a certain period of time. Here are uh, examples. Impulse, the software system is 100,000 new sessions uh, within a minute is an impulse. 8 million new messages in a queue within a few minutes is an impulse. Such an impulse can break your system within seconds. Right? So, what is stress? Stress in software is, uh, if, as an example, if you have a credit card processor, over a long period, uh, and, and if this credit card processor over a long period of time is slowly, res slowly responding. So this reduces the capacity to serve your customers, and it produces strain. So stress is producing strain, right, to, 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 to change the format of the overall application structure. And stress in the credit card processor produces strain because it propagates through the components. So first of all, messages are piling up in the, in the queue, then the queue is full, then you stop serving customer. This is if the failure of one component, right, is basically percolating through the overall system. You want to avoid this, right? I, let me go over that. Uh, you want to avoid that uh, because otherwise certain impulses and expressive, uh, excessive strain can trigger catastrophic failures in your system. An analogy, a steel plate with a microscopic crack in the material, if you put stress onto that, then the crack can begin to propagate faster and faster even to the steel plate and then the steel plate may crack. Right? How do we avoid this? Well, you need to design for failures. Right? Designed for failures. And, uh, here's an example. If you build an, auto, uh, an automotive car, what, you, what automotive engineers do, they build crumple zones into the car. So if the car crashes, basically, that not the passenger is, uh, gets, all, gets all the stress, but there is a, there's a cracking zone, a crumple zone in between in order to avoid that, that, the, that, the, that this impulse, that the shock is really going through all of the system. So how do we do that in uh, software? Well, first of all, the advice is you loosely couple your components, right? Uh, because loosely coupling acts as a shock absorber. You diminish the effects of errors instead of amplifying them, while uh, while uh, uh, this is all interesting. Interesting. This this was a unstable system, right? So tightly coupled, uh, tight coupling basically emphasizes impulses, right? Tight, cup, tight coupling, basically, you ask for a lot of stress in your system. And how do you cope with cracks in software? A very fine book, release it, right? Uh, there are a bunch of best practices. One of the most known best practices is a circuit breaker. And a circuit breaker is a little piece of advice that you need to implement in your application to wrapper all your components by an some sort of an, of, an of an electric circuit, right? And then you get stability, but cracks will happen, right? No software is ever perfect. And Sanjeeva told us this morning, right, we are always learning, right? And we need to do that, so design for failure. And this is done by loose coupling. The next, the next uh, 10 minutes, so I start a bit late, um, uh, will be on microservices. There are two interesting books that teach you what microservices are or, what, or how, do you, how microservices compare to quote-unquote traditional SOA. A very fine blog by Martin Fowler uh, is discussing what microservices are. And here's now a quote from my, Martin Fowler's blog. Martin Fowler said, well, what is a microservice? It's an architectural style. Um, an approach to develop a single application as a unit of small services. Each service is running its own process and communicates with lightweight mechanisms like HTTP. The service is built around business capabilities, independent deployable by, independent deployable by fully automated deployment machinery, and there's a bare minimum of centralized management of these services, which may be written in different programming languages and use different data storage technology. This is a quote. Now let's abstract it. Right, I'm only taking right now the bus, the bus words out of it. And what you see is, well, a microservice has the following property. It is small, it is running in its own process, it communicates often via HTTP, it's built around business capabilities, written in different programming language, used different data storage technologies, is independent deployed by fully automated uh, deployment machinery. Well, what the hell does small mean? Small in size of footprint in main memory, on disk, or did you only write a few uh, lines of code? What does small mean? 
Next is, uh, it's, uh, it's microservice should run in its own process. That's true for all services. If you follow SOA, right, the, your service runs in its own uh, process or container these days, right? Uh, most of the services, uh, are, or many services, are communicating via HTTP. That services are built around business capabilities in different programming languages, use different storage uh, technologies. This is at the heart of SAO at all. And that they are independently deployable, that's interesting. That's something new that's not in the, in the, in, in the guts of SOA. So as a summary, and by the way, these days we would substitute process by container, so a Docker container, for example. So the summary is a microservice is a service like you and me, a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose, right? But it is independent deployable by fully automated deployment machinery. And this is damn interesting. Why is that interesting? Because if you have a huge application or a monolithic application and you want to scale, what you typically do is you replicate the application for scalability reasons. If you do that, you pay a penalty. Because if you have here an Oracle database system or a WebSphere server in it, you need to pay license fee for Oracle for WebSphere in each of the replica. Right? Although maybe only a certain application function is needed very often, you replicate all of your application stack, which makes it very expensive. There are many other downsides. In order to solve that, what the microservices folks are saying, well, don't take the monolith, but split the monolith into fine-grained services microservices, and now you can replicate only those components that are under stress, under high demand. So for example, if the database management, oh sorry, if so the, the database management system um, needs to be replicated because you have a, have a huge data load there, you only need to replicate now the database system a couple of times. Right? If one application component is under high demand, right, you only replicate those, those, uh, those application components that are under high demand. So you don't pay the penalties, in this case, to replicate the database engine many times. You don't pay the license fees for it, right? And the essence of microservices, again, it's all about proper granularity of components that are independent deployable, and independent deployability is each component is independently deployable, and even automatically. And uh, microservices is not, is not a counterproposal to SOA. And it does not prove that service technology basically failed. In the opposite, they require loose coupling, which is at the heart of service technology. This is why service technology had been, has been invented. And they require a methodology to determine the proper granules for components. And this is, so what is the proper granularity? This is something that we call the holy grail of software engineering, right? There is no solution to determine what a small or proper granule is, right? If you ask somebody what is it, every serious person will say, I don't know. It depends. You bear, it, 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 so you need to do that. So don't expect a middleware vendor to tell you what is the proper uh, granularity, right? And what we have done is we have uh, basically written a book. We, we reported a couple of applications from, by companies like Daimler and so on uh, to the cloud. Existing applications, we have re-architected them and learned what failures might happen. And the best practices have been uh, documented here in, in a book uh, called Cloud Computing Patterns. And I skip over that here in the interest of time. It's a complete pattern language. Each, each box is a best practice, right? It's a recommendation how to do it. Right? And if you follow this, and many people, uh, uh, at least in, in, in Europe and in the US, they are following the pattern language to know how to build applications that fit natively in the cloud or that you can migrate to the cloud. And at the heart of it, I skipped over this slide, is loose coupling. If you build applications in a loose coupled manner, it's damn easy to bring them to the cloud and benefit from the architectural promises of the cloud. Summary, so if you want to build robust applications, Right? It's all about proper architecture and design. This is why I give you some advice on uh, circuit breakers, on hot pools, on watchdogs, and so on. Loose coupling is, a center, is the centerpiece of these kind of architectures and design. Uh, loose coupling is supported by all mainstream service technologies, right? be it traditional SOA, be it REST-based um, uh, architecture style. And finally, 
There is no middleware or tooling magic that ensures that you build good service-based applications. It's all about you to deploy good architectural principles like loose coupling. So thank you very much for your attention. As Sanjeeva said, I will also be around, right? And I'm happy to discuss that with you. Thank you.